Um, my name is Kiara. I was a camper for eight years. I stopped in 2012. I am currently getting my bachelor's degree in forensic science. And within the next year, I will be applying to master's programs to study genetics and genetic counseling, kind of both of them together. Um, so tell us about, um, you live in Brooklyn. Yes. Tell us a little bit about how you get around the city and then what your kind of travel experience is otherwise. Yes, no problem. Um, so I live in Brooklyn. It's a kind of, I live like right, um, uh, very close to Manhattan. And basically 90% of the time I take Accessoride around uh, New York City, depending on, really depends on where I'm going and if I know um, it's accessible around there. Um, or I'll take, if I don't take the train, I take the city bus a lot. Um, those are kind of, the bus and Accessoride are kind of my two preferred modes of transport transportation if I can't take the ferry because that's like my favorite favorite um I recently I'm currently planning a trip to um Nebraska for a conference um I went to a conference recently in Delaware um with my other disabled friend and I and um we took the Amtrak there because we just didn't it was still the same amount of time to take a plane and take the train so we just prefer to take the train um but i have been on a plane and it's interesting but um really it just comes down to like planning everything as much as possible so, yeah very much okay perfect Hi everyone. Um, so as, as Andy said, my name is Nina. I went to spa for 10 summers. Um, it's very exciting to see you all today. It's making me very nostalgic. Um, so yes, I grew up in Queens. I'm currently living in Brooklyn, not that far from Kiara. I'm in downtown Brooklyn um, and I'm, I'm studying to be a psychologist. So I'm in grad school. Um, a little bit about my traveling experience. So I'm pretty lucky that I chose to go to school in downtown Brooklyn because a lot of the transportation here is 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 pretty localized and accessible. So I live um, right by Atlantic Terminal, which has the Long Island Railroad, and I live um, near a lot of subway stations that have elevators. And unfortunately, in New York City, that is hard to come by. Um, so a lot of my transportation is either on the bus, on the subway, or accessoride if I'm going somewhere farther. Where I grew up, I didn't have access to the subway. So um, I probably started taking it more uh, in my adult life. Um, in terms of the places I've traveled to, so um, my family's from Greece. My dad was born and raised there. So I've been there with my family. Um, and in terms of my adult life, I traveled to London when I was in college. I studied abroad there. Um, and recently, last summer, Kiara and two of our other uh, people in our circle that are also disabled traveled to DC on Amtrak. And we stayed in a, in a, um, like a suite with one of our caretakers. And we can talk more about what that was like too, because that was definitely interesting traveling with four wheelchairs and it was so much fun. Um, yeah. Cool, thank you. And then last. Yeah, um, hi everybody. Um, I'm Joy Lenny, but everybody at camp knows me as Jojo, um, and I prefer it, honestly. Uh, but um, I spent, I believe, four years at camp, uh, probably the shortest time out of everyone. Um, but I really enjoyed my time there. And then uh, last summer, as some of you may know, and Annie mentioned, I worked at the camp office, um, and that was a lot of fun. Um, but I, uh, traveling experience, um, actually professional connection. Um, so um, currently I graduated in May 2019 from NYU uh, with a major in global public health and sociology and a minor in uh, disability studies. Um, and recently I got a job as a program coordinator at, at this organization called Mobility International USA. 
um, as uh, under the project called uh, the National the National Clearinghouse on Disability and Exchange. Um, and it's a project that it focuses on um, increasing the participation of people with disabilities um, in international exchange opportunities like study abroad, volunteering abroad or other things. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, um, but that's my professional connection. And then I studied abroad in London uh, while I went to school. I also studied in Washington, D.C. Um, so I know I'm familiar with the back and forth trip on Amtrak to D.C. and New York, um, which can be interesting and frustrating at the same time. Um, and I also, um, I was born in Dominican Republic um, and was raised there until the age of eight. Um, so I have experience growing up um, somewhere different. Um, and I also went back uh, to visit the Dominican Republic um, not too long ago, about four years now. Um, and so my experience going back was a lot different than growing up there. Um, and uh, lastly, I also traveled while I was abroad. Um, so that was cool. And I'll talk a little more about that later. Cool. Yeah. When I was a kid and I traveled to Greece, we would bring my manual chair, um, which was a lot easier of a process than bringing my motorized chair. And then I think in college, I started traveling with that. And um, so the process is, is pretty much you, you show up, you go through security um, and you waiting for your flight. And at that point, they have to take your motorized chair to where they put the luggage. So you don't have access to it on the flight with you, which is a much larger conversation. And there's petitions about this and, and all that, that hopefully, I mean, I don't know if on our lifetime, but we should be able to bring it on the plane with us, right? So it is best to call in advance to tell them that you will be at the airport at this time for this flight um, so they can know to have someone there to help you, especially if you're traveling alone. So we board first, right? So at some point, a TSA person, when you're waiting there for your flight, will come with an aisle chair and help you transfer into that so they can take your wheelchair to the luggage. And something that I started doing in college is I had a, a piece of paper that I would laminate that would list how to work my chair. And I would paste it to the back of it so people could see in like red fonts. I had it in three different languages so no one would have an excuse to say they didn't know, right? Because when they meet you to take your chair, you can explain it to them, but there's no guarantee that the person that's gonna bring your chair when you get off is gonna be the same you know, the same guy or have the same knowledge, right? So how to put my chair on manual, how to put it on brake, how to drive it, please turn it off when you park it, right? Because I'm imagining my chair like rolling around under the plane if it's on manual. Um, <laughs> and I think at, at that point, it's a, it's a time that we have to be very firm. You know, if you want them to drive your chair, tell them. If you want them to keep it on manual, tell them, right? Because um, there are a lot of horror stories about chairs coming back broken and stuff like that. Um, and I'm thinking of, oh God, in college, I, I, I had to go to do a conference. And this is the first time that I was traveling just with my friends. And we were going to DC, basically. So it's a very short flight. And um, they get everyone on the plane. This is going to there. They get everyone on the plane and it, there's some kind of delay, right? I don't know what it is. Eventually someone comes on the plane and says, are you the lady with the wheelchair? And I'm like, yeah. And then they say, your chair isn't fitting because the, the, the airplane we're on is a smaller one and it's not, it's too tall to get in the storage. And I'm like, did you, I'm trying to like brainstorm, okay, take off the headrest, right? At the time I had a headrest on my chair. He's like, yeah, we did that, ma'am. And I'm like, oh no, 
So then I had to give him very specific instructions on how to tilt my chair back so it would be lower and they were able to get the chair inside the storage part. Um, so that was a very bizarre scenario that I would never anticipate, right? So that is something too, how to operate the chair in case they need to do something like that. Um, and I think that becomes more important when you're flying locally, right? I can't imagine that happening on an international flight or something like that because they have bigger planes. Um, so it's, it's interesting that my domestic flight was a little more hectic than my international one. Um, but anyway, so that, that's kind of getting on the plane. Then when you, when you land, they let everyone off the plane first and you sit patiently for them to bring your wheelchair. Um, and then if you have someone with you, this is a point I should have mentioned before. If they have someone with you, you can, you, you can have them help you transfer in and out of the aisle chair. Um, but the TSA people are trained to, to help you with that. Um, so they'll kind of guide you out and bring you to your chair. Um, it usually takes uh, quite, uh, you know, a few minutes because they have to bring it um, <laughs> from God knows where on the plane. Um, but that's kind of the general for me. I'm also, my family's also from Dominican Republic, like Jojo. Um, so I travel there a lot. I actually forgot to mention that I was there last year. Um, so when I first traveled to Dominican Republic when I was younger, I traveled always with my manual chair. Um, to preface, I have brittle bones, so it's kind of always important that I stay safe. Um, so I always took my manual chair just to make sure that I had some transportation or some form of mobility once I got to my destination. But um, while I was in DR, one time I um, hurt myself um, because of my manual chair. It's like a very flim uh, flimsy chair. So I then purchased a, um, it's called, um, wow, I'm completely forgetting the name of it, but it's basically a power chair that um, folds and it's like a very, basic version of the power chair that I have already. Um, uh, tea, I'm going to look it up now. But um, I use that. I have been using that more when I travel domestically and um, internationally just because it allows me to have that um, uh, freedom to have a power chair, but I still don't have to deal with the complexities that come with traveling with my main power chair. I have traveled with my power chair. Um, I go to Florida. Um, I've gone to Florida with it. And um, what I do beforehand is I take off all non-essential parts of my chair. Um, so my headrest, my foot plates, um, I fold them. Um, my armrests, I try to remove. Anything that won't, that doesn't come off, I take off. Just to make sure that it's there when I get, when I land. Um, and like Nina said, kind of just going through all the checkpoints um, with the TSA people to make sure that they know how to handle my chair. Um, I prefer them keep it on manual just because why not? And um, I transfer onto the aisle chair and then get onto the plane and things like that. But um, I think just traveling with my chair when I go get to like the front I basically just tell them, like I have to tell them what kind of batteries I have for my chair and, you know, to make sure that it's safe for flying. But other than that, the process is generally smooth. I get to keep my chair until I get onto the plane. Um, and that's just something that I always prefer because I am smaller and fragile. So I'm like, please don't take me out of my chair unless it's completely dire. Um, but yeah. For me, I, I um prefer to walk onto the plane um, just because uh, I don't trust um, just the handling of everything else and I feel stable uh, walking so um, and it allows me to bring my crutches onto the aircraft in case I need to use the bathroom like during the flight um, and I'm usually like very specific about like what kind of help I need um, in terms of like boarding the plane. Um, but a tip that I learned from experience, just because um, I have had my chair broken 
or damage at least five times in like the times that I've traveled. Um, and it's been very frustrating. Uh, so I take pictures like um, at least 15 to 20 minutes before my boarding time that I know they're not gonna come and get the chair yet. Um, I take Please do. Um, Please do. Yeah, that it's important um, because you, you take pictures of like the things that you know are um, regularly broken, like my casters have been damaged several times. So I take pictures of them. And when I take pictures, they're time stamped and dated. So they can't tell me that the chair was broken before. Um, they handled it because like it's for a fact I have a picture and you broke it so you need to fix it. Um, so it's important for for to do that um, just as a precaution. It's not as in like let me take pictures because they're gonna break it. No, it's like let me take pictures so I'm safe and I know um, what they need to give me if something comes back wrong. Um, so I learned that uh, and that was helpful and then I also I uh, learned that like this part of my chair, which is like the um, the part that goes uh, right below my, um, between the tire and my legs uh, so that my clothes don't get dirty, tend to get lost a lot. I probably lost them like every two times I've traveled. So I ended up um, taking them off and putting them into the seat of my um, wheelchair, like unzipping it and putting it into the seat so that I know that it's not going to get lost or damaged. Um, and then I think, uh, I think that's mainly the two things that I do um, to make sure that things aren't lost or, or broken. Um, and then also I, um, you reminded me, Kara, with traveling to different places, you need to feel confident in your process. Like, um, I, I learned a lot, like every time I travel, I learn something new, um, but I know my process already. And I know that there are certain things that I need. So when I traveled to Dominican Republic, um, on my way back, they told me that I had to leave my chair, like at luggage, like I couldn't go to the boarding gate with my chair. Um, and I knew that wasn't true because I had gone uh, came, came and had done that process already. Um, and so one of the things that I don't do is tell people how to fold my chair or change my chair in any way, because it's pretty small. So I'm sure it's going to fit. And I don't want them to damage um, the chair, the folding matters or anything. So I don't tell them. And like one of the things I told my dad when we got to the airport is like, do not tell them that my chair folds in any way. Don't tell them. But we got to the airport and of course he told them and they were like, oh, well, we need to take your chair now. Um, I was like, no, you can't. And then I got here um, and my chair, like both casters were broken. The armrests were gone. The like back handles were destroyed. And I was just like, I should have stuck with my gut and like demanded that they let me get to the gate with my chair because it would have avoided so many problems. Um, so just feel confident in your process is my thing. Um, there's going to be people that tell you different things, but you there's rights and you have the right to explain your process. So. Absolutely. And I, um, just from kind of what I've heard from other people too, you know, if you have someone giving you a hard time asking for a manager who might be more familiar with what the rules and regulations are, because there are laws. Um, and if there's not laws, there's, there's processes. And like you said, Jojo, the way things are done um, and, you know, you should be accommodated to. So. Uh, yeah, so basically, as Nina mentioned earlier, um, the four of us went to um, Washington, D.C., and planning a trip for one wheelchair is way different than trying to, trying to plan for four. So it took, I think we've been planning, we had been planning our trip for like six months, mm -hmm. and basically, it just took a lot, a lot of time to it just started as a Google search, like accessible hotel rooms in Washington. 
and then we just found a whole bunch of different um, links. And now that I have Jojo's resources, that would uh, definitely help me tremendously. But um, what I did, and I found the website that I refound, it's um, accessiblego.com. And honestly, like, I don't trust anything. So once I looked up their resources, I double checked it with the web, the hotel's website, um, with Google, like Google Images to see like the hotel room that we had. And we kind of just like did a lot of group chats and like video calls with each other to see, oh, what do you think about this? Do you think we'd all fit? Like trying to arrange the beds, like two of us shared um, a bed each and um, looking at the bathroom, making sure that that was accessible. And we went through a lot of options and it was tough. And it took a lot of back and forth. And once we actually found the hotel, that was just the first problem because it was just the four of us and we didn't have any mode of like car or anything because no car fits four wheelchairs. So the next problem was trying to find a hotel that was near uh, a reliable source of transportation. And so that was another problem that we had. So, like. We basically, I think our hotel room, Nina would say, um, our hotel room really worked out well. Um, it wasn't the biggest, but it fit four wheelchairs and um, we were right by, you know, all the touristy things and it really just worked out great. I'm very happy. <laughs> good, so good. So you Google searched, you just looked things up and then everyone kind of, you triple double checked everything, double triple checked. Yeah. Yeah, we called the managers a bunch of time at a bunch of different hotels, um, kind of prefaced it with saying, by the way, there's four of us. And, you know, a lot of hotel managers were like, well, I don't know. I'm like, well, we'll make it work. Just tell us if, um, you know, if you have certain accommodations, especially with the bathroom. That was like our main thing to make sure that we could all shower because gross. And, and um, question, what was the situation with that? Did you guys bring your own shower chairs? Did you ha use what the, the hotel had? How did that work? So, um, all, well, I, my other friend and I have been travel, have been traveling a lot um, to different hotel rooms. So we kind of explained that shower situation to the others. And basically what the room that we picked had a fold down um, shower seat. Basically, it was literally just like a bench yeah, yeah, yeah. that like folded down from the wall and we were able to use that. I mean, I always uh, roll around with my reacher and that literally saves us all the time. And um, so as far as like being able to reach things, I always have my reacher um, to kind of turn on the lights because all of the lights, of course, were high um, to get the inevitable thing, the key cards that fall, you know. And I think it was just like really looking at the Google images of the different bathrooms at different hotels that really helped us narrow down. Like we see what they had and then we basically just all discussed to make sure that it would work for everybody and um, went from there. Yeah. So um, let's talk quickly. Actually, first of all, Nina and Joe, did you guys have anything to add to the hotel room? Um, um, yeah, I wanted to, um briefly um there's like it, it's a lot different when you're traveling internationally <laughs> than when you're traveling um like within the states um i had a lot a lot of issues uh while i was traveling across mm -hmm. um europe uh um when i was studying abroad in in london um i went to uh different parts uh like venice um and paris and um, Barcelona and every one of those places was completely different in the way that I that I found um, an accessible uh, room. Um, I have to be honest, I did not travel by myself um, when I was traveling across Europe because I didn't I didn't know what to expect um, and I didn't want to put myself in a situation where I would be in danger in any way. Um, so I waited for like a friend of mine came to visit and so we traveled together and then my brother came to visit and we traveled together to other places um so i always had like someone with me and then um 
one trip I went with like a group of uh, five girls and they found like an Airbnb to um, to stay at but it wasn't they found out it wasn't accessible like at the last minute and then I couldn't stay with them so I had to find um, an accessible like hotel close to where they were because we didn't want to be too far apart and it was also a safety issue have to travel um, with someone especially when you're a student so um, I was lucky enough to have someone here in the states that was like hey i'll help you i'll try and figure out what i can from here and set something up for you um but like for example i called a bunch of places when i was going to venice um to find the most accessible place possible and still when i got there like i couldn't take my chair up to the room um so i had to walk up um there were elevators and everything but the passages were so narrow that I just couldn't um, couldn't go with my chair. So I had to go with my crutches. And luckily, I had my brother with me so he could help me with everything else. Um, but even when you call and you're specifying exactly what you need and why you need it, sometimes they'll be like, oh, yes, yes, we have that. And then you show up and <laughs> it's not it. So. Um, just when traveling like internationally or around Europe and trying to find uh, cheap places, um, it can be, it can really hit you hard and, and kind of come back and bite you in the ass because it's like, um, that's why I always say like having a disability and like trying to figure out accessible places can be very expensive. Um, so one of the things I planned for was um, funding. So. I raised a lot of money and then I had a scholarship to study abroad. Um, so if you're planning to like study abroad or do some kind of thing like that, make sure to have like ample funding um, or as much as you can. And of course, like prepare for accessibility and non-accessible places, but that can really change things. I know you mentioned that website. Do you guys know of any other websites that like focuses on like accessible like for example like I don't know a board of accessible hotel rooms or anything like that mm -hmm. where it's kind of like crowdsourced well this website I liked a lot because it not only tells you like the website I'm mean, sorry the hotel rooms um in DC but it tells you like why they're accessible so like the first one for example it says it has mobility features such as rolling showers and a portable tub seat and all the other accommodations that they have. And they list that for every hotel um, oh. that they have listed. Yeah, what's that called again? Accessiblego.com. Accessible. Yes, Kathleen. I have something to add about that. You have to be a little bit careful with websites like that because yes. some sometimes you like book something that's supposed to be an accessible room and then you get there and they don't have the one that you asked for. And in some of these websites on the fine print, they can say that they can't necessarily guarantee the exact room that you asked for, which kind of destroys the point of these websites. Um, something like that happened to my sister and I in Manhattan. We wound up in a very, very, very narrow hotel room um, that wasn't quite... Um, what was presented so you have to be careful with these websites because for some odd reason they are allowed to give you something that's slightly different than what you booked and they particularly like to pull a fast one with the bathrooms like you can repeatedly say that you need a roll in shower and then they give you a bathtub um this has happened to me like a lot and like, I literally cannot get into a bathtub anymore. It is not safe. Something similar happened to my friend and I when we went to Indianapolis. We were told that we were going to get accessible room with roll-in shower. Um, that's not what they gave us. We had to fight with them. And then they tried to give us a shower, chair, a shower chair with three legs and tell us that it was safe to use and we were like uh-uh no 
Um, and they were like, well, we can get our engineer to see what they can do. And my friend was like, well, I am an engineer. And the lady was like, dot, ID. dot, dot. So <laughs> you have to be, like, super careful that they don't bait and switch you. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, yeah, definitely. I was definitely just going to mention, like, as an after um, thought, that this website or any website that you'll find on the internet are definitely not an end-all, be-all. They were kind of just like, I would see, I was like, oh, okay, because I've never been to Washington, D.C. before, so I didn't really know what my options were. Mm -hmm. So that website kind of just gave me an idea of what my options could be. And then from there, I went on to call a bunch of hotels and search the hotel website. So it's definitely, yeah, not a, a last resort um, to book your hotel. A good place. Yes, but, yes. Yeah. Okay. Per perfect. Yeah. I'm I always love hearing about that stuff anyways, because, um, it's just good to kind of add to the, you know, what you've got and always double and trip, double, triple check. So yeah, Kathleen, sorry. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have noticed, but something that really frustrates me about hotel design is the ones with the roll in showers only ever have one bed as if anyone, as if everyone who needs a roll in shower wants to, snuggle with their aid like um I mean like if my parents are with me whatever like we can jam into the bed but if you're like traveling with an aid or something like either they have to sleep on a crappy cot or you have to share the bed and it's like uh and those those king size beds they're not really they're not actually all that big in the end so we had a lot of, you know, stops on my way to college where my parents and I had to jam into a bed that was really not made for three people. And it was, uh, every once in a while you can find like a miraculous roll-in shower room with two queen beds, but it's rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think you're saying something, Caroline, but you're muted. Are you talking to the group? I don't think so. No, you good? Okay. So so when I when I went to London, I I picked I picked London for a few different reasons. One, because there was no um well, I, I have family in London, so, so that was a reason. But in, in terms of accessibility, um Every single cab in London has a wheelchair ramp, which is to, to, to New Yorkers are revolutionary. To Londoners, they're like, yeah, you guys don't have that. And I'm like, no. Um, <laughs> and, and, and it's interesting because the cab itself is tiny, but it has a ramp. So if you have a chair that is my size, which is pretty big and clunky, um, you, you pretty much just fit in it, right? So that's the wonderful thing about London. But then you look at their transportation system and about half of the subway stations have elevators, right? But then in their version of the ADA, um, that outlines bathroom accessibility is much more comprehensive than we have in the US. Every single place that I went to, except a Burger King, okay? So, except the American institution, <laughs> had a wheelchair accessible bathroom that looked almost identical, right? It was massive. It had this uh, lever to pull, so if you fell, if there was an emergency, you pull it. And then whoever hears the bell in the building comes and assists. Um, I mean, everything was really to the to, to the mark in a way that I haven't experienced here. So I think that, that is some of the most wonderful attributes of, of London specifically. Um, and then I, I went to Greece and it is drastically different, right? You know, Greece is, is old. It is um, so much of the like ancient, beautiful things about Greece is preserved, but you know, there's a thousand steps. Um, I found out recently that Athens subway system, which I didn't use as a kid because I was with my family, um, is completely accessible. It has elevators at every station, right? But then what do you do when you get out of the subway and there's cobblestone, right? When there is a step to get into um, every little corner store when there's no curb cut, right? 
So I think what, what I find myself doing, even just for fun sometimes, is going on Google Street View and looking at the places in different cities to see, can I actually get down the sidewalk? Are these sidewalks paved in a way that I can get down? How many places have those stupid one little step that they could put a ramp over but just don't want to, right? Um, so in, in terms of the US, I was so impressed with DC as well because um, the area that I live in in Brooklyn, it, it's like near um, Park Slope and Cobble Hill and a lot of brownstones with a ton of steps, but then the cute little shops have that one step that is so easy to fix, but no one does. I really didn't experience any of that in DC. I think Kiara, we found like one and we were looking, oh, yeah. Yeah. we were just looking for places that had steps and like there were maybe like one or two places that did. Yeah, and we were like shocked. <laughs> I know. Um, and, and again, in DC too, the, the subway system is completely accessible. But that is, you know. A novelty. Yeah, and it's because DC is so much smaller too, right? So I think you find little snippets in the city that you go to. Um, but yeah. Very good, thank you. All right, Jojo and Kiara, any other, do you, have, do you agree with that? I know, Jojo, you've been to London, um, any other places that you think are particularly accessible or, um, you know, that you went to and you were pleasantly surprised? Yeah, um, the bathroom situation was like one of my favorite things. <laughs> Quite honestly, um, when I, so I studied abroad in London and uh, when I arrived, I arrived, um, a week before um, all of the students. Uh, so I arrived with like the student leaders and like the RAs of, of school um, to set up. Uh, and cause they wanted me to have some like a week to adjust to London before I had to start school. Now. Um, and one of the things they had for me was um, a key for uh, London bathrooms. Uh, so I don't know if you knew this, Nina, but you basically, if you have this key, it's like the same key for any accessible bathroom in London. Um, and so I basically just carried this key around with me all the time. And then I remember um, going to Edinburgh at one point and apparently it's the same key. And um, someone asked me like, don't you have a key? And I was like, oh no, I left it at home. <laughs> Like, sorry. Um, but yeah, bathrooms are definitely one of my favorite things um, about London. Uh, one thing that also surprised me about London, I went to uh, the Globe Theater, which is the uh, one of the theater theaters, um, to watch a play. And they had this like elevated platform so that I could be uh, where everybody else was um, in the audience. But um, the place was elevated so I could like sit right next to my friends and I could still see whereas like I'm sure a lot of you have experienced like going to a concert or somewhere else and like you can't see because people are sitting um so that was one of my favorite things about about London, just finding no. those little things um and then DC I spent a full semester and a summer in DC and I absolutely love it. Like um, the transportation being completely accessible compared to New York uh, was a life changer for me. Um, quick tip, uh, there's like a website that you can go to in DC where you can set up alerts um, to let you know if there's something wrong with an elevator um, ahead of time. So I lived and worked um, in DC or interned so I had an alert set up to send me information about elevators um, an hour before I had to start my commute to my internship. So I would get this notification every morning and it told me this elevator is working, this elevator is working, there might be an issue here, um, you can take this route. And I was like, complete, like completely life-changing um, just to have that be done for me and not have to check it every day because sometimes you forget mm -hmm. but yeah absolutely Kiara um I think definitely what Nina and Jojo said are definitely helpful just to like know um 
like to make sure that the bathrooms are accessible are amazing. Um, I mean, in Dominican Republic, I mean, I'm fortunate enough that I am either small enough or my chair is small enough to fit in most bathrooms. Um, if not, I can be carried really easily. So I do have that added kind of edge. Um, but I think just as far as like looking up ahead of time is a life changer um, and just, you know, trying to find out as much information as possible. Yeah. Um, I was going to say Disney World is very wheelchair, family friendly, accessible vacation spot. Good. Good trip there. Yeah, like if you stay in any of the hotels, you can take the bus or the monorail and they yeah. have ramps. You can get your chair on some of the rides. A lot of yeah. the And a lot of the yeah. rides, you can just go right up front too. Yeah. Yeah, but I've had an issue with that. Still, even though you need a pass sometimes, it's still good. Yeah. And I like, and I was just there, and we were also trying to just push for getting a, a room like closest to the buses too. Because yeah. they're even the resorts are really spread out, you know. Yeah. So. And you're at Disney in the background right now, right? What? You're at Disney what? in the background right now, right, Ellie? Yeah. <laughs> Kathleen, what were you seeing? And then go ahead, Chris, after Kathleen. I have never gone international with um, my tower chair before, but something interesting I learned at school from uh, people who did uh, that I didn't know about and it's really good to know is the voltage rating is different in other countries, so you have to be careful to bring the right kind of charger or adapter because otherwise you could fry your chair battery um and this girl i went to school with she went to france and she didn't know that and her chair almost lit on fire um and they they had to go to like a dme place in france and it was like a big thing so um yeah i didn't know that and it's good to know um the voltage rating here is 120, and in the UK it's 250, um, and it's different in other countries, so um, you have to check that out if you're going to bring a power chair and uh, respond accordingly so you don't sizzle yourself when you get there. Nina, what did you do for that? Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, Kat, because I was just thinking about this earlier. When I got to London, um, I plugged in my chair, fell asleep at like six o'clock because, you know, jet lag. And then I, I, I wake up at midnight and the chair isn't charging and I'm panicking. Um, and then that's when I realized that only specific kinds of adapters work and you have to buy the right kind of one. And I was very expensive in buying them. So I think I bought like three ones and I just, got incredibly lucky that the other one that I bought worked mm -hmm. but yeah I think in our resources there was a, a link about that that Jojo put in so that is definitely really important and something I got lucky <laughs> about yeah. Um, yeah. along with the resources um, so as I mentioned I'm working um, at an organization that works on helping people like participate in um, study abroad and other experiences. So if that's something that you're thinking about or um, might be curious about, uh, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, so feel free to like reach out to me. Um, I'm sure like Annie mentioned, she'll uh, send out some resources. But um, when I started working here, I was really impressed with the amount of resources available. And there's like personal stories um, so that you can also hear from like other people. Um, and there's also a um, inquiry service where you can send in a question and we'll literally just work on the best answer possible and research a lot of information for you. Um, and that is for, um, they call it purpose for the travel. So if you're traveling to study abroad or study or intern or work or volunteer um, and that kind of stuff. And of course, if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out or like contact me through camp. Um, I'm always available and happy to offer information. Oh, thank you. 
So I just want to say that Savannah, it's really old. It was built in like the 1700s. There, there, there has been like, I think a president has stayed in the Davenport, in our Davenport house, which is like this really nice hotel that's not very accessible. But mm-hmm. anyway, Savannah's old. It's yes. old. But it's also accessible if you know where to go. Mm. So how did you, you're from there, you live there. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. No, how did I hear about Savannah? Oh, you know, just. Well, so how did you hear about your, besides like living it, you know, how did you find the places? Was it between talking to people? Stuff up so, my, my dad works downtown. He's a lawyer. His office is downtown. It's Bull Street, which is on Johnson Square, which is pretty accessible. It's, it's beautiful. Savannah is absolutely beautiful. It's like, it's suburban New York City, basically. So, you know, there's actual trees and you get oxygen. Uh, but there, there are some, there are some ramps, like my dad's office, like in the square, if you want to go to Panera Bread, you go down the ramp. The, the ramp is fine, but then getting back up to the square of Panera, it's very steep and I have like somewhat nightmares on it. Mm-hmm. And it, so if you if you are downtown and you're in a wheelchair, make sure somebody is with you. Like, if if you have your chest harness, you'll be you'll be fine. But if you don't like to wear it, like me, um, and someone's with you and you don't and you don't feel safe, ask someone to hold your chest. Okay. Um, and like, you you'll you'll be fine. But there are some ramps where I have to kick and scream and throw a fit and cause a scene for my dad to turn around like all right fine we're we're, we're going another way because he's a lawyer sometimes he walks and then if I'm with him he's always in a rush so I have to (laughs) yell (laughs) to go another way but most of the time it's like you know what we don't have time for this let's just suck it up and it's actually fine it's a lot it looks a whole lot scarier than it is 